So I just want to say welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're really lucky to have um, Gareth with us here today talking about um, bilingual service provision. Um, so Gareth travelled um, to uh, Canada and um, met with um, Indigenous groups and um, did research and he's come back to share that with us and we're really pleased and I think this is going to be a really interesting topic today. So um, I'm not going to muck around anymore, I'm just going to um, keep um, admitting the latecomers into the, <laughs> but I will ask you all if you can um, all uh, mute your microphone so we don't get any background noise. Um, and it might be nice if you can, um, there's an option if you right click on your name to, to make sure that you've got your name and the um, organisation you come from. So if you're asking questions, then Gareth knows who you are, which will be really cool. Uh, you don't need to have your video on. Sometimes that helps if you've got slow bandwidth. So if you want to turn your video off, that's fine. We won't hold it against you. But if you want to show off your cat later, then that's also fine. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that's that's it for me. Um, welcome, and um, I'll hand over to Gareth. Thanks. Tēnā koe, Helen o te rā tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou e whakarungu mai nei, e tahuri mai nei, a ki tēnei kaupapa o tātou. Tēnei wēmerei, wāinga nui tonu i te rāhui. Uh, so we're at midpoint through this four-week phase of our lo lockdown. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch straight into this uh, this corridor and host has disabled the attendee screen sharing. Helen, if you could just allow me to share my screen, please. Heather, Helen, sorry. Let's see how that goes. There we go. And yeah, this is um, this is a discussion on on some observations uh, and some reflections that I made about our bilingual practice at Ngā Taonga and generally within um, our GLAM institutions. So, ko rite tapu whare kōrero rā nei ki te tukuratonga ki te reo Māori, ki te reo Pākehā hoki. Is my GLAM institution ready to offer bilingual services in Māori and English? So that is the the opportunity. I'd like to frame this whole kaupapa as an opportunity for us to reflect on, to think about um, the readiness uh, the resource implications for GLEAM institutions to provide bilingual services in Māori and English. We may already be doing this. Um, we may be uh, ready to expand uh, our bilingual output and that's what this discussion will be covering off today. Uh, a little bit about the context. Uh, one of the themes that was covered off on the trip to Canada by me in November 19 was some of the observations on how Canada approaches bilingualism. Uh, at the First Nations Language Keepers gathering at Saskatoon, I was uh, privileged to sit in an audience with a thousand other language revitalization people, uh, practitioners from all across Canada, there were some from the US and some from uh, Mexico, and they were all expressing their whanaunga tanga and the, the commonalities that they had in terms of their languages. I visited the Indigenous Archiving Project in Yellowknife in Northwest Territories as well. I'd like to thank the sponsors, NDF, Lianza, Internet NZ, who supported this trip through the Paul Reynolds No Numpty Scholarship. Uh, this is about us defining or thinking about what a definition of bilingual service is. Today's case study is based on Canada and these the observations that I've made here in Canada. I'm not so much going to spend time on defining what uh, bilingual services, but I'm going to ask people to think about what it means for them. What does it mean in your role? What does providing a bilingual service mean in your organisation? And of course, our case study today is Canada. In Canada, uh, Canada has a strong uh, legal basis for the uh, quality of French and English having full equal status in law. It's enshrined in legislation and policy and in practice. If you're a French speaker in Canada, you've got the opportunity to, and they are a minority, they have the opportunity to engage with society fully in 
the French language. You can access services. You can live your life through uh, through French. Uh, much of Canada uh, has really strong French language history uh, through for a whole bunch of historical reasons. And just a little side note that we won't really um, delve in today is that Wales is another interesting case study for those that are interested in, in exemplary uh, cases of nations uh, implementing bilingual and bicultural kaupapa. So it's official. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that French and English have equal status within the law in Canada. So if we were to do research about how government um, supports that bilingual, this, the equal status of French and English, we go to the front page of the Canadian government portal and we have a fully bilingual set of options available. Terms and conditions are in English and French. We have an English language button, a French language button, and of course, a bilingual representation of the government of Canada. This is the first point of call. Um, Canada is unlike other uh, colonial societies that stem from the UK, UK, US, Canada, Australia, Aotearoa, and that it has fully bilingual status, in this case it's in English and French. So it's pretty unique among that, that, that set of nations. So I've got step, taken one click in to the French option, the portal to the government of Canada. And I have a fully um, French language set of options available. There's a whole lot of, obviously, there's a focus and there's attention there to COVID-19. Uh, at the top right there, you can see a button where you can see, access all of that information in English and switch backwards and forwards between the uh, English language information and the French language information. So all agencies of government, policies, forms, logins, search engines, everything is available in French and has a fully bilingual option. So as a French speaker, this is uh, one of the privileges that you have, one of the ways that um, official bilingualism manifests itself in, in Canada. Quite a lot of information on this map. This map uh, points us, oh, there's, there's two bits that I wanted to focus on. In the top right hand corner, you can see that almost 8 million Canadians are French speaking. 8 million of about 35 million, in the, in almost 35 million in the full population. There's one other step that I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, on the top left hand side of the map, you've got the Northwest Territories. 1,200 people in the Northwest Territories are French speaking out of a total population of 40,000. This is one of the, uh, the territories that I visited. Uh, and you'll see later on how that compares to the number of indigenous speakers in Northwest Territories. So, 7 million French speakers, 2,000 of those speakers are in Northwest Territories. This map here, tells us what the next most dominant languages are after English and French by territory. If you look at the two uh, territories that are in green on this map, you'll see that there are 2,000 speakers of one of the indigenous languages of Northwest Territory, so that's more than there are French speakers. And it's only one of several languages in that territory. In Nunavut, uh, there are 21,000 speakers of Inuktitut. And then to the right of the map, you'll see that the other two blue um, territories, territories that are mapped here in blue, also have um, indigenous languages as the top of the list after English and French. So that's an interesting little set of statistics to, to paint a picture for us about where the speakers are, where the French speakers are, where the indigenous speakers are. What does this mean? What does it mean to have French and English um, had to have uh, equal status? In, front, in Canada, you have the ability to access services and access information in French. Uh, Organisations make a, an active offer. 
Uh, if you engage with an agency and you uh, engage with somebody who's a non-French speaker, then they will make an active offer to you to refer you to a French language service and somebody that can uh, discuss your pakeha with you in French. You have the ability to live life through the French language uh, across Canada, in school, in government, in GLAM settings. And of course, there's all of the infrastructure and the support that happens um, behind the scenes to, to make that happen. So you're empowered to live your life through French in Canada, and it's official. I'm going to share some, some snaps, some snaps from the trip. Um, this is one of my first engagements with the bilingual French English kaupapa, not long after takeoff on the Air Canada flight heading towards Vancouver, I got presented, um, we were um, given some bilingual pretzels, so they're in French and they're in English there. Of course, this is following fully bilingual announcements, a bilingual safety video and a bilingual promo video for Air Canada. It became evident over time that to be an Air Canada um, staff member, you need to have a level of French and English language skills because obviously if the kaupapa of Air Canada is to do the safety announcements fully in French and English, then you'd need at least one staff member on board who's able to provide that service. And then you get to the airport. This is one of the bilingual uh, airport signs. Have a think as, as, as we look through these snaps about some of the design decisions, some of the layout decisions that have been informed by and guided by policies that, um, that are in place at a national level and at a, at a regional and local level as well. Then I went to get a trolley, what I think we call in Aotearoa, something that we call trolleys. Uh, you've got a triangle sign here. You can figure out for yourselves what the Canadian French word is for carts. Um, English, French, and I think Mandarin, I can be corrected on that. This is the Ottawa Art Gallery. Uh, it's, again, it presents itself bilingually in uh, English and in French. Uh, it reminded me of the MTG in, in Hastings and got me thinking about what the MTG would be, the an anagram would be if it was, um, the acronym, sorry, if it was in Māori as well as English. This is another sign of the same art gallery. So there's the English name and the French name. This electronic billboard switched to French just after this photo was taken and I didn't get a snap of that, otherwise I'd be able to uh, share with you what be a member means is in French. You've got um, English first here and French below. We're across the road at a university um, it had French first and English first. So there are different ways of approaching the design of your, your signage. As a tourist, I was asked to cross to the other side. We're instructed and um, here you've got the English first. So I learned what the French word is for fire. When I saw this um, fire alarm, in the building somewhere. And it reminded me of um, a recent development in Aotearoa where our fire trucks have got some elements of bilingual signage of them. So in the same way that I learned the word, the French word for fire back here, hopefully there might be an educational aspect to increasing bilingualism in Aotearoa that people um, engage with bilingual signage and if they're not familiar with the terms, maybe they can um, use the signs uh, as a way of learning what the Māori word for fire is, which is ahi. And of course, back to the mirror version, it's iha. And it sort of um, reflects itself quite well there. Uh, this is the main street in Ottawa, uh, Wellington Street, something that we'll be familiar with. It's the street that the parliament is on. Uh, the parliament is across the road from here. So you can see that they've written the sign in French and in English. 
Rue Wellington and Wellington Street. This is in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. The Legislative Assembly, the Parliament for the Territory is located in Yellowknife. Uh, they've got French and English on the sign, you can't see the French here, as well as eight Indigenous languages. I apologise though, I wouldn't be able to point out to you what any of these, what uh, the other languages are. I was, didn't become familiar enough with them. But you can see uh, one sign, 10 languages. So they've made some des design decisions about the way they're going to incorporate 10 languages outside their local parliamentary building or legislative assembly. So you've got 10 languages there. Now here you have, um, this is a map in the museum in Yellowknife uh, showing the Nunavut uh, territory. What I picked up, what I pick up here is that you've got two or three languages represented in the sign, or three or four actually. It's, you've got French at the bottom, English uh, second from the bottom, and at the top, um, I presume it's Inuktitut, uh, the language of the Nunavut territory. Uh, I picked up while I was over there that in federal and territory funding, there are, through the French language uh, legislation, there are obligations to French language that become attached to funding, which would mean that even indigenous groups who receive funding, put a website together, put other information and comms together, there are obligations to provide that information or to have an active offer of providing that information in French. So that sort of, it's an interesting dynamic when you consider that the imperatives of Indigenous people of revitalising their own languages, where they might need to actively provide French language information and whether or not that um, clashes with the ability or uh, places tension on the ability to develop their uh, information in their own language. This is another GLAM institution, it's in Yellowknife. Uh, it's got the local Denisulin language, French and English for the Northwestern Territory Archives. So I figured out here that French for NWT is TNO. I can also see that Monday to Friday, this is my guess on the bottom right hand side there, Monday to Friday is written in Denisulin just on the bottom left of this picture. I made a little observation when I looked at this that they've, they haven't got AM and PM in the times that they've got in the opening times there. Uh, as somebody that translates Māori information from time to time, uh, it can be a challenge to even translate AM and PM. So it's useful just to avoid AM and PM because you'd have to write it in Māori and in English and here you have to write it in French, which I'm not sure if AM and PM translate into French as well. Someone might be able to update me about that a little bit later. This is another an anecdote and observation in Yellowknife. Yellowknife, the capital of Northwest Territories, has a population of 44,000 people. We saw before that they've got 2,000 speakers of uh, one Indigenous language, and there will be speakers of the other seven official Indigenous languages in Northwest Territories. Uh, 1,200 French speakers in the Territory. Because of the status of French, there are three schools in Yellowknife that offer French language instruction. Uh, one of those schools being a full immersion school. Could uh, cope up a wee wee, a school where everything is, all of the instruction is done through the French language. And again, this is one of those tensions that um, from a Māori point of view, we would say, is there a similar you know, level of uh, status afforded to the indigenous language? So that would be, uh, that's an observation that you make that French language is elevated as opposed to the ability to study and to um, engage with Indigenous languages uh, in Yellowknife and in the Northwest Territories. Another anecdote about something that I picked up about 
Canadian French. Uh, French were involved in colonization of Canada from the 16th century. They, like an island, they were obviously being physically separated from France. They retained some characteristics of 17th century French that no longer exists in France. So they, the language developed in one way uh, and maintained some forms of speech that are no longer used in France and might be considered by French speakers in France as quaint, but they're still a normal part of Canadian French. I thought about if there was an analogy there for Te Reo Māori, and the analogy that I thought of was, what does archaic or historic um, Māori language look like compared to Māori speaking today? Where would, where would we um, find our island of our traditional language compared to uh, the contemporary Māori language? Would it be in the written uh, records of the 1800s? Would it be in the audiovisual records of the 1950s and 1960s? We, we would be able to delve into and experience Māori as it, as it has traditionally been spoken. So yeah, to sort of leave that question there. I wanted to come back to old Aotearoa now and talk about our approach to uh, provision of Māori language services in Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision the National Audiovisual Archive. Uh, what we do is informed by the policies that we have in place to support um, how we will support Te Reo Māori Health. Some of the time we'll, we'll offer services and information bilingually. Our kaupapa, our constitution, uh, commits us to the treaty and of course under the treaty Te Reo is a taonga so constitutionally, we, we have a commitment to te reo. We have a policy and a strategy that uh, underpins our, our Māori language work. Uh, under the policy, we have a REM, remuneration program in place where Māori language speakers are supported um, in the Māori language work that they bring to the organisation. We have cataloging guidelines to underpin our cataloging when we do cataloging in Te Reo. What do we do in Te Reo Māori as an organisation? We catalogue some of the time in Māori. Uh, when content is in Māori, we'll catalogue it in Māori. If it's mixed, if it's 70% Te Reo, we'd, we'd uh, catalogue that content in Māori. If it's 70% English, chances are we'll catalogue it in English. Uh, we do some reporting in Te Reo. We do some of our communications in Te Reo, some social media, not all social media is fully bilingual, but some is based on some of our resource, the resource that we have at hand. Uh, some of our newsletter writings are in Te Reo or are bilingual. Uh, sometimes we get correspondence in Māori, an email, a letter in Māori, in which case we will, um, we'll, we'll put a, we have a process, we'll translate that, uh, the request or uh, email to be clear on what the what it is that's being sought, what the kaupapa of the email is. Uh, we'll develop a response and then uh, uh, reply to that person in Māori. So we're able to offer a level of engagement in Te Reo Māori that we're confident is accurate and meets the needs of, of those clients, those members of the public. What are some of the considerations for us as an archive, as an audiovisual archive? Resource, it takes budget, um, it takes time to uh, develop bilingual services, whether they're fully bilingual or bilingual some of the time. And there's an element of capacity. One of the ways that we've built our capacity into Ngā Taonga is to I have in place a number of specialist positions. Some of our Māori specialist positions are real specific, so have uh, Māori language skills tagged to those roles. Uh, another uh, way of uh, supporting our, our analysis of our capacity is we participate in the Level Finder examination that is administered by the Māori Language Commission. Uh, our Māori speaking staff uh, will sit the exam, bring the result back to the organisation, 
and that helps us to assess the level of Māori language skills that we have, which inf influences our sign-offs and QA processes. Taking, um, taking this example from Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau tweeted recently, um, I think it was COVID related. You see that he tweeted in English and then a few moments later he tweeted in French. Uh, I picked up that to be a French uh, a, a politician in Canada, uh, you need to think about what sort of French language skills that you need just like you would on Air Canada. Um, to engage with French speaking audiences, if you want to be Prime Minister, it probably helps to be fluent in French. So there would have been a process, there, there will be a process in place for the way that Justin treats, whether or not tweets, whether or not he develops his copy in French and then gets it translated into English, or if you've got two sort of comps, people sitting side by side, or one that has both sets of skills, there'll be a process behind this happening and um, when we do the same, when we tweet bilingually, obviously, obviously there's a, a, um, a process sitting behind how we uh, develop our copy in English first and Māori second or vice versa. Uh, Twitter in particular with its 240 character limit can be quite a challenge. My, the tip that I use uh, when developing tweets in Māori is to plonk your uh, your, if you're translating English language text into a draft Twitter um, draft tweet and you'll know when you've gone over your character limit because um, the, uh, it, it tells you quite clearly so you really need to concise, concise, concise to get all of your text into and it, it, quite, often you, quite often you need to change the meaning of your communication because you're trying to fit so much into, uh, into a tweet and the way that Māori language is structured uh, means you need to be tika, but you also need to be concise and that can be quite a challenge, so it's a little process there. Uh, this is a, an example of a catalogue entry uh, on the online catalogue at Ngā Taonga. You can see there that the title is Te Reo o Te Māori it's a November 1974 title. You can press play and, and play this item. There's a nine or ten line description of how uh, the kaupapa is Te Hoko Whitua Tu and Ted Nepia talks to Ngui Pi Whairangi about Tuini Ngāwai and all of the, uh, the waiata that we produced coming out of Tokumari Baby. In this case, there's a brief, very brief description at the end in English. Because of resource and capacity, we'd love to, the ideal possibly would be to uh, provide fully bilingual descriptions for every catalogue description. However, with, limit, with less resource and, and less capacity, uh, in this case, we've, um, we've provided a pointer to the English language speakers so that they will get a sense about what this uh, content is. And if they really want to content, uh, engage with this title, uh, they might sit with a Māori speaker and, and work through the content because it's all in Māori anyway. Um, to conclude, um, I observed fully bilingual practice in Canada and French and English with the languages in place, the official languages that, um, that enabled me to observe how French and English have equal status and how that manifests in the way that services are provided and the way that society uh, arranges itself. Obviously, there's a, a difference in status between Indigenous and non-Indigenous languages. Indigenous languages may have equal status in some parts of Canada. The way that that's implemented um, may or may not um, be implemented in the way that uh, French and English uh, statuses manifest across society and within organisations. The trip has given me an opportunity to reflect on our own practice as an audiovisual archive. Uh, what we do, what we could do, what we do well, what we could improve, uh, reflect, it helps us to reflect, it's given me an opportunity to reflect on 
uh, what sort of systems and processes that we have in place and that we need to have in place to continue to increase or maintain our bilingual output, our output in Māori language and in English language. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm privileged to have the opportunity to share these observations with GLAM institutions, with other GLAM institutions through this webinar with Lianza, who will then share this kōrero and hopefully carry on this dialogue. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. I think it's question time, question and feedback time. I'll leave you with a random image from uh, from Matamata Piako. If it's happening in Matamata, it's happening everywhere. Okay, thanks, um, Gareth. It's uh, Anna Pickering here. I had to jump in for Helen because she got dumped out of Zoom. Hilda. Uh, so she <laughs> she sent me a crazy text. So um, thank you so much. And um, if uh, the the, the the um, video from the first webinar um, that Gareth did on cataloging archival audio material is on the Lianza YouTube channel, so you can find it there. It went up yesterday, it's already had 36 views. And the next webinar that Gareth is going to be sharing is um, Wednesday, the 22nd of April. So after, um, um, after Easter, and it's uh, on navigating rights and sharing taonga. So you might yeah. like to join again there. There might be some people that are trying to join. If you could just let them into the room, please. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, we were just um, opening for questions or comments. Uh, I should be looking at the chat, should I? People can um, add the comments by or questions by uh, by chat or just um, if there are any questions, that would be a good time. Uh, I did get to travel to Montreal, which has got the highest um, French-speaking population in Quebec, and yeah, everything was in French there. It was like what I imagined being in France would be like, because uh, yeah, everybody was speaking French in, um, in Quebec and Montreal, and it was quite hard actually to, to navigate my way around buying things in the shop, catching a bus, catching a train. Yeah. Any anecdotes that people want to share from their organizations? What are the challenges? What are you um, really enjoying doing in this space? Uh, I wondered if, here's a question. I wondered if you notice of any one or other language more likely to be privileged in signs. Um, I know that this is decisions about uh, the status of languages and signage is enshrined in policy and legislation. So I can't give you a definitive answer, sorry, for um, Quebec. My hunch is that French is first in Quebec because it's the dominant language. Uh, my presumption is that when English is the majority language in, in any particular community or territory, that English would um, have preference, be, would be the first language in signage. But um, you're talking about even announcements on buses, some of the bus services in, um, in the middle of Canada would announce every stop that was coming up and that would be pronounced, that would be announced in French and in English. So it's it really is in the, the detail of the provision of services that they'll tell you that Wellington Street is coming up and then they'll tell you the same thing again in French. 
And another question that we have here is, is it mostly government or public institutions that um, are more involved in providing bilingual services? Is there high uptake with, uptake with private businesses to have similar obligation under law? Again, I'm not an expert, but I am aware that within Quebec, the territory of Quebec, there is legislation that mandates that businesses will have bilingual, if not French, titles. I think I remember seeing an article about, I think, a business like Walmart and Walmart being mandated under legislation in Quebec. They had to um, translate their name, if you like. Um, so that's the extent that they, and the level of seriousness that they, uh, they apply to the, the notion of, of, of being fully bilingual, their advertising, their broadcasting, that even the name of your business needs to have a, uh, an element of, of Frenchness to it. Uh, another question, has our organization altered policies or strategies to increase bilingual practices? Have non maori staff and maybe Māori developing their deal increased their bilingual approaches? Some of the Development of staff is, of course, an important issue. We staff are Māori speaking. We encourage staff to continue to develop the level of Māori language skill. Uh, say I set the LFE, the Level Finder examination tomorrow, and my result was three, um, and there's an element of Māori language work in my role. Uh, but the obvious thing for me to do would be to continue to develop my language skills and to um, aim to achieve a four, for example, so that I'd be able to say with confidence, this is the level of, uh, that I've reached in terms of uh, Māori language. Uh, for non-Māori staff, uh, being a, as, as a bicultural organisation, as an organisation that's committed to our kaupapa, our constitution, which is committed to te tiriti, uh, we have practices, we have policies around how we uh, support te reo, like good pronunciation, like uh, accurate use of te reo Māori. Where there's a Māori word in English, or a Māori greeting, or a Māori place name, then all staff are um, required to get that right, to get the spelling right, to check if you're not sure, to have tools available for to be able to check in on the spelling of Taupo or Matamata or Paraparaumu or Tamaki Makoto. Tamaki Makoto is always a challenging one because this is it one word, two words, or three. And so we will check the um, authority, the, the references with some authority like the Tofuri Te Reo Māori. Another question an act of offer. Um, well, the act of offer of service in, in Montreal was, was everywhere. Uh, it was hard to be an English speaker and to, to buy something at the shop to know where you were going on the train to understand the announcements because they were all in French and less bilingual. Uh, but an active offer is where an organisation understands its obligations to, to offer French services and to um, uh, to have uh, front of house staff, for example, that are bilingual, so that um, anyone that makes contact with the organisation through a phone line or through reception is able to um, to do that through French or English. So, just a small observation: when you um, on Air Canada they'll greet you bilingual, they'll say, bonjour, good morning, which indicates to me that if I want to say bonjour and then ask them a question or ask them how they are or ask them what time of flight you see that I can, I can do that in French if I want to and I can have confidence that, um, oh, that when I order my coffee, when I ask for my coffee, even ordering, asking for a coffee, on Air Canada, it can become a challenge because uh, the person is speaking French and you're not quite sure how to ask for a coffee with milk in French. And so you sort of 
you flounder a little bit. Uh, another question, are any of the examples that you encountered in the GLAM context translatable to your organization directly? I think they're, they're, they're all translatable. Uh, if you look at search engines in places like Wales and in Canada, you have a fully bilingual option. So have a think about searching for a title or searching for an item in a collection and having the option of a French language search and an English language search. Would they give the same results based on things like um, subject headings, uh, based on things like the content that um, that Kopapa is available in, the, the language that that, con that Kopapa is available in. So, um, how do you design a fully bilingual um, database uh, that is transferable between the languages so that the public interface, the search engine at, on a library or in an archive, uh, offers, offers its um, search function in both languages. You can switch from one to the other, but does the result differ? So that would be something that would be interesting to explore with uh, practitioners in, in places like Canada that are, that are familiar with developing databases and catalogs, catalogs that are fully available in both languages. I'm not sure if anybody has got to that stage in Aotearoa yet. You've got archives, you've got National Library, ourselves, Ngā Taonga, a smaller organisation. Um, maybe one of the Wānanga libraries has, has explored and providing their information in their search engines in, I'm not too sure. Thank you for your questions. Any observations? People can jump in and offer questions and observations. There's another question. Could you elaborate on some of the tools your organization uses to support non Māori in developing their reo and their ability to offer bilingual services, especially for less confident staff members? I guess it's a scale, it's a continuum. Um, and on that continuum, we attempt to have everybody have a shared understanding about where we stand in relation to Te Reo Māori, what sort of tools that they have available, whether it's everybody being aware where the Macron button is, everybody being aware that they can check Māori words on māoridictionary.co.nz, they can ask their colleagues if they need Māori language support, um, and having a range of tools and, and things in place that there is clarity about a QA process so that when we do a tweet in Te Reo, a catalogue entry in Te Reo, that we as an organisation, we can be confident that what we are delivering is, is, is tika, is accurate. So we encourage st all staff to, to ask, if they're not sure, just to ask. Um, there's, there's a bunch of examples. It might be how you use one word and how, if you're unfamiliar with a word, it would be very easy just to make a mistake if you're not confident. And like I said, there are a number of tools available to, to our colleagues to, to support them. Uh, other forms of support and development can include you know, basic pronunciation classes so that we can get everybody on the same page in terms of their basic pronunciation. We've got a Macron in our organisational name, so now Tongue, everybody should at least be able to put the R into Ngā Tonga, which in turn means that they can put the R in Tamaki Makoto and then eventually the OR in Topo. So little 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 measures like that that add up to a collective um, set of knowledge and, and a collective approach to to what we do to support Te Reo Māori and to, to be a Māori language friendly organisation. And, and hopefully we, we do that in an encouraging way. I've been doing all the talking, so please feel free to throw your question out um, to the group.
just unmute yourself or um, if not, um, post a question to chat. Uh, we had a question last week. Uh, what's the term for COVID-19 in Māori? Because different news organisations were using different versions of that word. Uh, we collaborated with some other GLAM institutions. We asked some of their other catalogues if they'd thought about it. And one organisation came back with a link from Te Tauta Whiri from the Māori Language Commission and they had developed a list we imagine anticipate that they would have developed that list using the expertise in Tota Fidi and their networks so that helped us to um to come to a decision about the style decision that we will be making with um COVID-19 mate corona mate corona and a number of other terms like social distancing um, self-isolation. There's a bunch of terms that have been released by its total pretty, so that was useful. Any more pathway going once, going twice? Uh, another, just another tool that we have to support our um, processes is, is whether or not you're in comms or in our information services team who do cataloging. That we uh, we have a we have guidelines in place about. So you're developing some multi language content. You're developing some content that might have multi language in it, like a place name, what's the process um, that we have in place to, to QA, to sign off on. Um, whereabouts is the style list, the, the list of words that are, uh, decisions have been made about uh, Māori style, like Tāmaki Makoto, like Ngāpuhi, for example. Um, our style decision is to write Ngāpuhi as one word with a macro on the A, and that's because um, that's the preference of the iwi in Ngāpuhi, right in Ngāpuhi, they write it as one word. So we, we made a style decision to uh, write Ngāpuhi as Ngāpuhi does. Kua ahua mutu ana. Not sure if there are any other questions coming through. Any comments or statements that people would like to make, any reflections? about their own organisation. Looks like just some appreciative uh, um, um, messages in the chat. I've got one word, one more um, question. Thank you, Catherine from Southern Libraries. Yeah. Um, when we're checking for accuracy around words, terms, phrases, would you go first to your local rinanga, or is there a national body that has a function we can ask? Uh, being aware of um, not overloading local context with questions, etc. I think uh, the answer to that is a little bit of both. Uh, from a national point of view, uh, we defer to the, and this is easy to Google, the um, orthographic guidelines, the Māori language orthographic guidelines, those are published by Te Tauruwhiri Te Reo Māori, the Māori Language Commission. They have a whole lot of guidance around where do you put the dashes in a name like Te Whānau Apanui, where do you put the macrons in a name like Te Whānau Apanui. Uh, they encourage consistency of the form of words, consistency in the use of macrons, uh, so that's our sort of go-to document, Māori Dictionary for Individual Words, uh, the orthographic guidelines for um, the style of words, names generally. It's about 30 pages, so it's got some really good and detailed 
and guidance uh, in um, the layout of Māori roots. Uh, sometimes we will approach iwi about the uh, preferred term that they use. Uh, we do build dialect into what we do. Um, an exa example would be tupuna and tipuna for ancestor or for grandparents. Uh, we did a tweet once about somebody's tupuna in Ngāti Raukawa. I think I might have mentioned this last week. The person that drafted the tweet wrote tipuna, but we changed that to tupuna on the basis that we presume that in Ngāti Raukawa they used tupuna and it would have been more appropriate to... Uh, if the tweet was about somebody in Ngāti Pro or in Mātātu Waka, we would have used tipuna and then tipuna, if we were doing it in plural, with a macro. Uh, so there's a lot of information available online through the orthographic conventions. Māori dictionary is a, is a bit of a go-to for double checking. You can say a word, but you, can, you might not quite be sure whether or not it's a long vowel or a short vowel, and Māori dictionary is a, is a good, um, good reference point for, for checking in on the, the, the form of a word. Mm. We're just about out of time. We're at our midpoint. I've been on lockdown for two weeks now officially, so um, something to reflect on, something to plan for for the next two weeks of lockdown and see how we go. Tēnā koutou e whakarungo mai nei, mā taki taki mai nei. Thanks everybody for, for joining in. Um, for all, from all of your institutions, mai te waipaunamu, raki ura, uh, tainua ki te hika Māori, te hiku o te hika Māori. It's uh, been great to have a representation from everybody from all around the Motu. Tēnā koutou. Back to you, Anna. Sure, I just thank you everybody for joining and um, check out the resources on, on YouTube and um, hope to see you next, next time, um, April 22nd. Thank you so much, Gareth. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou.